I think the one thing that really helped me when I had an inkling of an idea and I just didn't quite believe in myself was surrounded myself with people who gave me the belief like your podcast, my podcast books. I literally consumed other people's thoughts every single day to make myself believe in myself. And so I think that's the one thing I would say is choose your people really carefully and start consuming so that you start to really, really believe that you can do this because you can, you can do anything. Hello and welcome to the Unlocked Podcast. I'm your host, Ricky Locke, and this podcast is an adventure on how to unlock the best version of ourselves and live an extraordinary life. If you've ever thought, what is the secret to success and why is it that some people are more successful than others, then you're in the right place. As in this podcast, I'm talking to the experts and successful people from around the world and with my own personal stories of failure. Together, we can unlock the success in your career, business, and even your personal life too. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any of my latest episodes released every Wednesday. Enjoy the show. Welcome back to this week's episode. This week, I am absolutely delighted to share my conversation with my great friend, Michelle Lloyd. She is a very inspirational woman, and I was honored to chat with her to share her story. Now, following a challenging childhood and being diagnosed with ADHD and dyslexia, Michelle entered adulthood, always feeling dissatisfied, worthless, and unhappy. But eventually, she finally discovered the answers to why her brain felt totally inadequate and what she needed to do. And since, she has now created an absolute powerhouse community called United Art Space, which has since grown into a 4,500 plus community of art lovers from around the world. And she helps artists to share their art and make a living doing what they love. Now, before this episode starts, there are three takeaways that you will learn from this episode. The first takeaway is how to unlock your full potential. The second takeaway is how to remove the barriers to fear and unlock what holds you back from living the life you deserve. And finally, why your art matters and how you can make a living doing what you love. I'm a big fan of Michelle's work and this episode is a fantastic one. Now, if you do enjoy this episode, then give a little bit of love. Head over to Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Podchaser. There is a link in the show notes and leave Michelle and myself a little bit of love and tell us what you think of this episode. We would love that. Now, without further ado, enjoy this episode with Michelle Lloyd. Hello, Michelle. Welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to speaking to your wonderful audience. Thank you. It is a pleasure. I'm very excited about this, Michelle, because we, we both know... We've only known each other now for about three to four months now. So it's quite, a, yeah, quite a it short time. longer. Mm. Yeah. And I know that we, we hit it off quite quickly because you have a very similar story to kind of what I'm doing now. And uh, we, we'll deep dive into that. Um, but first, if no one's ever heard of you, what do you do? Who are you, Michelle? What do you do? So I'm Michelle Lloyd. I'm based in Shropshire in the UK. And for the last five years, I've built a business helping people who love making art and we help them make art that they are really passionate about and help them get it out into the world. Help them to start selling, help them to grow confidence. And it's all based mainly online. And when COVID hit, it all became online. We did do some in-person things, but it's all through online courses and memberships and community. Fantastic. And and, and this is, you know, this is a big community. This is worldwide, isn't it? Is it like four and a half thousand members, I believe? Yeah, well, we've, yeah, we've got a thousand pay members within our membership, but we've got 50,000 followers across all our channels and our email and <laughs> wow. Wow. all around the world. Yeah, yeah. It's fantastic. And and when else are we going to deep dive into this? Because this didn't just happen, uh, like this, this happened, didn't happen overnight. This is something that's built up and this kind of spark has been kind of ignited for a while, isn't it? But um, yeah, I'd love yeah. to find out because I know there's going to be a lot of listeners to this podcast that may be inspired by your story and yeah. how you've got to what you're doing right now. But the reason, one of the biggest things that I wanted to get you on was because very soon to me, and this is your strap line, I guess, is that you help people unlock their potential to make a living out of what they love. Yes, so yes. That's just amazing. So tell us about that. what has led to this moment of you unlocking people's potential. 
I think years and years ago, growing up, you know, I came from, I was brought up on a council estate and brought up with people that did not have dreams. You know, we didn't dream. We worked really, really hard. And I was brought up to believe that you have to work hard and you have to do a job that you don't enjoy. So that's my mentality then as a young adult. And in those early days, I had ADHD and dyslexia, but it was undiagnosed. So there was a lot of insecurity within me as well as a person. And I remember really struggling in social situations, in work situations. I'd get very anxious, have panic attacks because I always felt like I was going to be found out and I was always winging in life. And so I was kind of a troubled person for a long time. And I was given medication, diagnosed with all these things. And I just felt like I was always desperately unhappy inside. Then when I hit mid twenties, I was diagnosed with dyslexia and ADHD. And all of a sudden it was like, oh my gosh, this answers questions to why I felt so inadequate and why I was struggling in many of my jobs and in life. And it felt like someone had just given me a lifeline. And I remember reading books about dyslexia and ADHD. And one of them, well, lots of them said, people with dyslexia are usually creative. And I was like, (laughs) hmm why am I not creative? (laughs) And it just suddenly (laughs) dawned on me in that moment that, that I had been creative as a child, but I just completely lost it as a, as a grown up. And I remember in that moment thinking, I'm going to sign up for an art course. I want to be creative. And so that was like the big defining moment there of stepping out and doing an art course and then opening my world to the arts, which I'd kind of just disregarded for so many years. And in hindsight now, I think art is what I needed back in those days when I was desperately unhappy. But I then explored art, did art courses and started to just live in the world of arts and meet other artists. And I then took a sabbatical from work. I worked at Asda's head office back in the day. This was many, 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 many years ago. And as a mature student, I then went to art school and that was up in Leeds, actually. Mm. And yeah, I always thought that I'd never be able to get a degree in anything because that's what I'd convinced myself. I was locked, Ricky, because I, I convinced myself I'll never be able to be educated. I failed all my GCSEs and and it was a, a belief that I convinced myself that I'll never, ever pass anything. So that was a massive hurdle for me to embrace that and go for that. And I got my degree and I studied and I made art every day and it was incredible. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, Michelle, best years we, of my life. Sorry to interrupt. Where do you think that belief came from then? The, the limiting belief. Yeah, or, for, for not obviously getting you know GCSEs and your grades. Yeah, where did yeah. that come from? I think it was accumulation of things going wrong in my life and being desperately unhappy and always feeling like I am a broken person that's what I started to believe and I think anything that went wrong and the fact that I didn't get my GCSEs and the fact that every time I tried to study as a as an adult I was always struggling and I couldn't do the written work it just fueled the belief that I am broken and I'm never going to be able to get anything like this in life and yeah evidence yeah and so I literally convinced myself that that was the case yeah yeah and also convinced myself that I'd never earn over a certain amount I can I was always kind of capped at 20,000 pounds a year I could not earn over that amount and I convinced myself that's because I've got dyslexia that's the story I told myself and I believed until only like a couple of years ago actually so yes that then really replaced one of the table legs you know our good friend Steve McDermott talks about your beliefs and how they're stabilized with legs and I then started to change the belief that okay I've just got a degree wow so I I can do these things that I didn't think I could do and I think that was maybe when I started to see shifts but you know there was something so much more in the arts and expressing myself and over those six years of making it really helped me understand more about why I was feeling the way I was feeling. And I was able to articulate myself in a way that I couldn't verbally. And that was just life-changing for me in so many ways. And even now when I'm trying to figure out what I'm feeling, art is the answer for me. It helps me identify why I feel the way I do. So it's so powerful. But when I graduated after spending all six years and, and, just taking all this time out to focus on it 
I was then unemployable. <laughs> I couldn't get a job. <laughs> and I remember spending six months applying for jobs and getting knocked down, wasn't even getting interviews. I remember friends saying to me, oh, are you really disappointed that you did art now? <laughs> and, <laughs> wow. and Good friend, and yeah, supportive friend, yeah. <laughs> I know. And so then I started to think, wow, have I made the wrong decision? But I, I think though part of me just knew that I'd had the best six years ever. So, well, you know, I'd take that over anything. So I plodded on applying for jobs. I even was about to apply for a job in a warehouse stacking shelves, which there's nothing wrong with, but I just thought, this isn't what I've just spent six years doing this degree for. Yeah. So then there was something in that moment that I just thought, no, no, I'm not doing that. And I remember sitting in a doctor's surgery one day reading a magazine and the whole article was about people that had been made redundant and they set up their own businesses. And I was like, hmm, mm. setting up your own business. <laughs> well, I've got ADHD and it's a dyslexia. I'd find that really difficult, wouldn't I? And so the story started to appear, but the, the seed was planted basically. And then you know, when you set your sights on something, I, I then started to see opportunities everywhere around setting up your own business. And my brain started to get really tuned in. And I remember meeting a lady through an article in a local magazine where she was helping startups. So by this point, I was starting to think, you know, what could I do as a, as a business? And Actually, I remember when I finished art school, I was invited to attend a startup business session, but I declined it because I said, no, I've just studied art. That's nothing to do with business. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Ironic that I now teach this stuff. Yeah, yeah. And so um, I went to see this lady and I, and I started to say to her, you know, I, I can't get a job and I've just studied art. And she was like, what would you like to do? And I said, well, I really miss being around a community and I've tried to look for an art studio. And when I lived in Leeds, I was part of a studio and there's nothing here. So how about I set a studio up? If there isn't one, let's set one up. And so she backed me and got me a grant and we started to look at properties together and all of this started to become real and we found a really, really beautiful building. And that's where it all began. United Art Space was born as a physical studio space. And that came with lots of challenges because we had big overheads and it was an amazing experience. But after 12 months, I then fell pregnant and it just wasn't the right time. So we ended up closing it down. And it was a really big decision to make, but I knew as a new parent that I had to focus on my daughter. So that was a tough call, but one that I made and I look back now and it was right. And so then I was a devoted new mum, <laughs> figuring all of that out for a while. Um, and then it was kind of after my second child was born, Isaac, that then I started to really miss the arts community. So I'd had a bit of a, a break in between. And I remember feeding in the middle of the night and I got online and I was just thinking, I really miss being part of a group and I was quite limited in being able to be in physical spaces so I thought I'll set up an online group for artists and this was five years ago wow. and it all started there so I set up a group called the virtual art studio and it was it was bringing people together from around the world doing art challenges and making art together and it kind of filled my need really mm. and then it just started to grow and grow and grow and then people, I would see artwork that was amazing. And I'd say, what are you doing with this artwork? And over and over again, I'd get nothing. It just sits in a drawer, nothing. I don't really do anything with it. And then I just thought, no, I can't have this. So I then became obsessed with what does it take to be an artist that sells? What does it take to be confident and put your work out there and make a living from it? And so I just yeah. devoured books and researched and then I came across a lady called Beth Kempton, who has a business called Do What You Love for Life, which coincided with my own life of, of living this dream of serving artists and people that love making art and them also doing what they love for, for a, a living. And this whole concept of do what you love for life was completely alien to me, having been brought up in the way that I had been. Yeah. So yeah, it just opened up massive, massive doors and opportunities. And then it's grown to what it is today. Wow. So, so firstly, you know, thank you for sharing that. That's an incredible story. And there, there's so much to, to kind of 
uh, dissect from that as well. And I resonate with you so much on that because it's a very similar story in terms of, uh, I think I coasted for quite a lot of my life until I kind of found what I wanted to do. But one of the things that I'd love to go back to is like, you obviously at a young age, you had this idea, you had these you know, self-limiting beliefs, you you thought there was something with you that was probably stopping you. And then when you had your diagnosis and all of this was quite kind of young in your life. And it, it takes me back to think about even as a child, you know, I think I've shared this on another podcast that as you're a uh, you know, young child and uh, as a baby, you're taught to be creative and playful and paint and draw. And then as soon as you go to school, you're given an A4 lined bit of paper and they tell you to keep in the lines. So even from an early age, you kind of, condition to stop being creative you know and Kat Hayes who came on to the podcast a couple of months ago talks about this idea of you know why do we have to stop being playful and creative you know we can be as adults but even from an early age we have to stop and yeah. we've got to write in the lines yeah, and I find that so that's... you know kind of conditioning that like yourself that I don't I don't think I don't know this might be another talk for another podcast sometime about <laughs> I don't know the education system but I don't remember as a child or at school saying maybe Ricky you could be a full-time professional magician or speaker there was none of that oh so no I, think, I, rem- yeah. I remember my um you know the questionnaire they gave you at the last year of school and it came out a uh, babysitter um <laughs> chef airline pilot it was those are completely random things <laughs> yeah yeah it's, it's crazy isn't it like like when do you you know why are we brought up in this way and so it's, like, it's very similar isn't it to like um following the crowd you know why why is that the way life is and I think that's why people like your friend said you know do you regret doing art now I even remember when I left um you know my career and got me redundant and I told my mum I'm going to go full-time magician and she went oh Ricky how are you going to pay your mortgage (laughs) you know (laughs) and it's just because the way the world is brought in that way and they were all conditioned that you leave school you might go uni and then you go get your job and then you work nine to five you come home you eat you go to bed and then you repeat but yeah. actually, there's no kind of inspiration except for what you're doing now of helping other artists to say, actually, there is another path and this mm-hmm. is the path you want to take. Yeah. But there's something I think linked really well with this about fear. And I know you talk a lot about this, about how fear holds artists back. And um, I, I, even for me, I can think about a lot of the times that even going full time thinking, am I going to be able to pay my mortgage or what happens if I don't get enough money this month or what if that client doesn't book me? So tell us about fear and how that's kind of played a role into where getting to you right where you are right now. Well, I think fear controlled me for so many years and I didn't actually realize it until I started to step out of my comfort zone and then start to really follow what I felt passionate about. That's when I started to see fear within me. And I realized that I had so many blocks and still do, but I I was oblivious to fear. So I I guess the stories that I was telling myself, I just believed they were correct. And it was funny. It was the first time I sold something. I remember saying the price and I just went and it's too (laughs) pounds like this. And I realized in that moment, I have issues. (laughs) I need to sort these out. Otherwise I'm never going to be able to make a living. And it was about then just becoming really, really self-aware, mm. really self-aware and noticing every thought that crops up at the decision that I make. And am I doing this because I really believe that's the truth or am I doing this because I'm scared? And I remember running my first ever workshop. It was a huge online workshop with thousands of people registered to take part. And ironically, it was about mindset and about fear. Ah. <laughs> and the night before, I turned around to my husband and I went, I don't think I want to run United Art Space anymore. And he went, (laughs) of course you do. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, no, no, I really don't. And he went, you realize this is because you're scared because you've got the workshop tomorrow. And I was like, of course it isn't. I'm teaching fear. I know fear. And I was like, hold on a minute. I I am scared. So it manifests itself, you know, in so many ways that you actually believe the stories that you tell yourself so that's one of the biggest things for me has been really really questioning and taking a look at myself and saying you know is this really the truth yeah definitely I think it was Steve was saying a couple of weeks ago about you know it's about looking at it was on your um your wonderful belief you know a little talk about the idea of identifying your own beliefs and and obviously working out are they hindering you or are they helping you and I think that that's it's difficult isn't it because in society 
the way we, we look at things, uh, you know, social media and everything, it, it's really difficult to do something that's different from the norm. So that's where I think a lot of that fear comes in. You know, I remember the same thing going to one of my first wedding fairs and saying, yeah, it's uh, it's 300 quid. It's like, sorry, how much? 300 quid. It's like, it's like I was kind of like, sell, you know, not selling myself. Like, yeah, you don't have to pay me. It's okay, you know. Yeah, and, and, yeah. And that's so hard, isn't it? But I think if, if any artists are, are listening right now and they're looking to, you know, that they feel exactly like the same thing, they've got this wonderful passion, all creatives out there looking to make a living, you yeah. know, out of their dreams. What what would you say to them based on your experience about identifying some of those beliefs that you had and doing it? So if we went back to that workshop, for example, you had that mm-hmm. fear the night before. Mm-hmm. What happened after you did the workshop? You still oh, alive. it was... Yeah. yeah, it was amazing. And I think most artists have beliefs and I and I see them now in themselves that are very, very similar, that I'm not good enough. There's so much on social media nowadays that makes people think that they're inferior to others. It also makes them feel that there's so much art out there anyway. So why should they bother? It's such a completely saturated market. So there's so much evidence there if you're looking for it to support the fact that it's not going to be worth your while and it's not possible so it's about really reframing that and I think it's starting small so what I teach my members is just tackle one limiting belief at a time so whenever I think about what I want to do next I ask myself what is the biggest limiting belief I have about making this happen and let's just start there and just reframe that and turn it around and shine a light on it and acknowledge that it's there so that it doesn't hold you back and if you just tackle one at a time then you'll end up over time you know really growing as a person and I think that's that's the best thing that I've started to do now is to tackle one thing at a time yeah I love that it reminds me of um, something that's happened to me within the last couple of years I think as I kind of you know left career thinking I'm going to pursue my dreams you know not really sure what's going to happen you know how much income we're going to come in and I think there's this comparison of looking at other creatives in my industry other magicians and thinking well I'm not doing that oh does that then therefore mean that I'm inferior or I'm not as good mm-hmm. and you absolutely I had to kind of you know tackle that same thing of reframing that and go mm-hmm. well actually let's look at this in a different perspective actually they've been doing it for 20 years Ricky you're still quite early on in your infancy years of doing this. Um, they probably live in a different town, different world, and maybe a more affluent area than you live. So actually you go, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think we can get sucked up into that, can't we? And it must be really difficult because art, I, I guess, I mean, I, I am, a, well, I'm not an artist, Michelle. I'm holding this up for the camera so you can see, as you'll recognise, the only art I can do is like mind mapping and stuff like that, really. But it's a um, very beautiful mind map. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, yeah. But even like with, you know, what I do, it, it's classed as an art. But I think as well that the challenges that I find as well, which I'd love to ask you how people deal with the that fear of, of, of price. I, mean, I won't talk about pricing exactly, but mm-hmm. how do you sell yourself at the correct value? So going back to like my example of I'm going to go out and say, right, I'm 300 pounds or whatever for a wedding. To a lot of people, what I've always experienced is like, £300, mate, that's why I earn in a bloody week. And you want that in two or yeah. three hours? No way, yeah. no way. So yeah. how do people get over that idea of actually, this is what I've spent 20, 30 years making. This is my price. This yeah. is what I'm worth. Yeah, I think one of the things is, first of all, is to acknowledge that, yes, not everyone is going to be able to afford your artwork. And yes, there are going to be people that think it's expensive. But there are also going to be people out there that think it's really, really cheap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And because it's so subjective. And so one of the things that I teach is find your voice, find your people. And all the time we are working on people being authentic and finding their true voice. And then from what they're making and why they're making it, we help people then connect to people that are really aligned with what they're doing. And with pricing, it it is tricky. You know, you have to look at where you are putting yourself and who you're putting your work to. And I always say that if you're not putting your work in the right context, it won't have a voice or it will land with people that think it's really expensive. So when you do start to price and if you do want to go the higher end, then that's the people that you start to look for and you put it on the radar and you say, right, these are the kind of people that I want to sell to. And a lot of the time I say to people, you can choose 
who your audience are. You can choose who your buyers are. And we do a lot of work in my membership, creating profiles and you'll create a customer profile, give them a name. How much do they earn? What do they read? Where are they? And you write to them through your social media. You write to them and you speak when you're doing a video. It's as if you're speaking to them and like attracts like. And yeah, it takes time. You know, you're not just going to in a week suddenly just start attracting those types of people. But if you're consistently focused on the type of people that you want to attract and sell to and you keep speaking to them and go on a mission to find them, um, do some power hours. I like to call these power hours where we spend some time on social media, searching for keywords related to what we're doing. Um, you, you suddenly grow an audience of people that really value you. And there is also a lot to be said for the way you communicate about your art and the more confidence you have in what you do. And art is an emotional response as well so I talk a lot about that emotional response and storytelling and the more you can bring that to the surface the more you connect with people so all of it accumulates then in more desire for what you have more price you know price increase so but small steps find your voice find your people and I always say you only need to find the next one person who connects with what you do and keep going and then find the next person and the next person and as we know Ricky then when you find your person you meet you meet another yes. five people from that one person like how we met so yeah, absolutely it becomes a beautiful domino effect yeah it is there, there is this crazy kind of ripple effect isn't there with it and I know that this kind of also uh, taps into I know that obviously you're a big fan of Tribe and our big pal Stu McLaren um, and this idea of you know the law of attraction and the law of vibration as well you know how you kind of mm -hmm. set your, your stand really and how mm -hmm. you program yourself uh, going back to something you just said there, it reminds me of something about, I think it's in Will Smith's, I've said this I think a couple of times now on the podcast, so I apologise for anyone listening. In Will Smith's um, biography, if you've read it, it's a brand new one. The first chapter he talks about building a brick wall with his brother outside his father's shop. His father said, as a kid, um, I want you to build a wall around the, the shop. And him and his brother take a year to build this wall. They've got no, no expensive tools or anything like that. It's just by hand, you know, cement and everything, doing the bricks together. And throughout that year, they have constant battles thinking, this isn't going to happen. It's not going to work. Why are we doing this? Getting angry. And then one day they're about to give up and his dad walks out and says, stop focusing on the wall. Focus on the brick. And it's this idea of, let's just do this one bit at a time, one step. And eventually, when obviously they build the wall a year later, his dad comes out and says, now don't let me hear you say you can't do anything in your life. Which is why he's now this you know, mega superstar and he's so successful. And that's the thing, isn't it? I think we sometimes look at this idea of, I wish I could be that person, you know, or I wish yeah. I could be, you know, a professional artist, a professional magician, whatever it might be. But actually yeah. it's about the small steps. Just start small, like you just said there. Take a one foot in front of the other and yeah. uh, you'll get there, won't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Wow. Well, um, so tell us a little bit as well. I'd love to hear more about the United Art Space. I got a lovely little teaser of it uh, a couple of weeks ago. So thank you for that by seeing the, the talk you did with Steve. And yeah. Um, yeah, so tell us about United Art Space. So what is it that you're actually doing with these guys right now? It sounds like a, a fantastic community. I've seen some of the Facebook posts. I've seen some of the, the great testimonials and the amazing stuff. And we'll put a link into the show notes so that obviously people can find out more. But tell us what yeah. sort of things you're doing right now with uh, artists and what we're seeing right now in that space. Yeah, so we have annual events online for free and we've got one coming up in April. We run it every year and it's called Your Art Matters. And that event is open to anyone who likes making art. And it really is about reinforcing the fact that you all have a voice and everyone is creative and that you to be an artist just need to tap into what it is that you want to feel and say through artwork so we really celebrate that in people and we see a massive shift in people and within a week of saying out loud I'm an artist and um, just be really confident enough to be themselves so we run that and we have paid programs as well so we have a membership called the hub and we have hubsters and hubblings <laughs> and hub stars they all call themselves yes <laughs> and in that we are really teaching people how to make art they love and then turn it into a living and we have a roadmap that outlines all the steps that you need to take step by step so you don't have to think and it gives people more time and lots and lots of support um, and then we've also got a course that we run once a year called the seven keys which is it's creating a success plan, basically, and teaching artists how to really delve into why they make art, what it is, how to build a collection. So, yeah, over the years, we've put these resources together 
and they're having a profound impact. I remember when I wrote my seven keys course five years ago, I just didn't realize the impact it would have on so many lives because we've literally taken people from all different walks of life. Some people have been, you know, not educated, uh, homeless drug addicts and um, yeah, to professors, to people that have been academics for decades. And I just love the extremity of people we have in our community and how they've been brought together through the power of art and they still all support each other. And it doesn't matter what background you have. Yeah you've got a voice through art and one of my members Simone yeah she she was a a lecturer for 20 odd years in the arts but couldn't sell her art she was totally stuck and she's now got a studio making a living and so one of my oldest members she's so lovely Sylvan she's 83 this year and you know she's not making a living but she's making art She's so happy when she joined us. She was scared to put a picture on her profile. She was scared to put her art out in the world. And now she's doing a tick. She's doing a TikTok course. She's getting her art out in the world. She's doing abstract. And she says she's never been happier at 83. How amazing is that? Amazing. Yeah. Wow. (laughs) Wow. So yeah, yeah. Well, I I think it's inspirational what you've done and, and what you are still doing. You know, to have people like that, 83 years old, to now finally be happy in their life is just that's priceless isn't it you know you can't yeah. buy that yeah I, I think, and those yeah. I was just gonna Sorry, say go those on. who think those who think that it's too too late to make it happen it really isn't because if yes. someone can do it at 83 then yeah. you've got no excuse <laughs> oh yeah you know what I, I wrote I always write down things Michelle like during a podcast thinking well I'm gonna ask this and then it just goes off on a massive tangent so I've got loads of things I wanted <laughs> to ask you but again you've just inspired me again by a lady called Sister Madonna which I think I might yeah. put on the YouTube the channel um sister madonna i think when she was like uh 60 or something she was told by um like the priest to, to go for a run you know and uh she wanted to break that belief so you know rebuild the table of um could she do running you know a marathon and she went and did a marathon and then she tried to break the belief of doing a triathlon and she was now i think she still is sponsored by nike and they call her the iron nun and i think to this point in day she's now nearly 100 and she's done over 400 triathlons yeah <laughs> just Whoa. because and that just goes to show isn't it that the, the age isn't anything and i think yeah. in one of my summary things about this episode that i'm thinking about is is this idea of labels you mm. as a child mm. me as mm. a child we, we both had our labels for ourselves we were probably given labels by other people but actually those labels are just you know you just take them off you don't have to have that define you as you have, and that 83 year old amazing woman that actually she was had this belief, you know, self limiting belief that actually take that label off. And actually, you can do this, you can make a, a wonderful living out of your passion. And, and, and you are a perfect example of that. So yeah, I think you're a very inspirational, very inspirational lady. So Michelle, thank, thank you, you uh, for coming on to the podcast. Before we finish, there is two questions that I'd love to ask you. Um, my first question to you is obviously based on your experience and in, in where you are to this point in time and that wonderful journey that you've had from not really knowing what you wanted to do and then now obviously helping people and unlocking their potential. What would you say to someone who's listening to this episode, very similar to your story, wants to go make a living out of their art, their passion, and they just feel like, you know what, that might be me. I think I feel like Michelle. I've got that fear, maybe some imposter syndrome. What is one thing you would say to them right now to help them make a living out of their passion? I think the one thing that really helped me when I had an inkling of an idea and I just didn't quite believe in myself was surrounded myself with people who gave me the belief, like your podcast, my podcast, um, books. I literally consumed other people's thoughts every single day to make myself believe in myself. And so I think that's the one thing I would say is choose your people really carefully and start consuming so that you start to really, really believe that you can do this because you can, you can do anything. Yeah. Love that. Priceless. Michelle, if people want to find out more about you or they might want to sign up to the United Art Space, I'm going to shout out to a good listener here, Katie Goodwin, who is an artist friend of mine uh, near Nottingham who has a passion. I think she's a teacher as well, but she's obviously going through that kind of migration of wanting to do this full time. So shout out to Katie. But if someone wants to find out more about what you do, you have an amazing podcast as well called Your Art Matters. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the podcast as well. 
Yeah, I love the podcast because I record that every Monday and it's really to set people up with motivation and inspiration to get through the week ahead. And so, yeah, that goes out every week and we are starting to feature guests from this year because usually it's just me talking away. (laughs) So we've got some guests lined up. Uh, yourself included thank you Um, and so yeah if anybody wants to look at what we have on offer it's at unitedartspace.org and on our website you can download our freebies and find out more about the courses that I've mentioned today thank you Michelle it's an absolute pleasure good luck with everything and I look forward to our paths crossing again later on this year thanks for coming thank you so much for having me thank you Thank you, Michelle, for coming on to the podcast and sharing your wonderful story. And if you did enjoy this episode, then don't forget, head to the show notes. You can find out more about the United Art Space and Michelle's amazing work. And if you did enjoy the episode, then head over to Apple Podcast or Spotify or Podchaser and leave us a review. And let's get this story shared out to the world. Thank you for listening. I'll join you on another episode of Unlocked soon. Bye-bye.